Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I said last week, and I want to repeat, I'm so privileged to be the preacher here. You know, you do not come here to listen to me preach. You come here to worship God, and I'm so glad for that, because if you were coming to hear me preach, nobody would be here at all. But I thank God that I have the pleasure and the privilege and the honor, really, of being here to preach as you come out to worship God. Thank you, and I mean that with all my heart. Please turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're actually going to turn to chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, and I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, this is one of the seven churches of ancient Asia, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Fortunately, they weren't totally buried, at least not at that point. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. So there was some vitals that were still detectable by Jesus that are ready to die. I mean, parts of you are in critical condition unless you do something. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember. Think back. Therefore, how you received and heard, hold fast and repent. And I want to focus on that last thought, or those last thoughts. Remember. Remember what? The gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing, as Paul would say in Romans 1.16, that would be capable of saving us. And the idea is remember how excited you were to hear that gospel, how eager you were to obey that gospel, and how excited you were to be saved. Hold on to that memory. And then he, when he says repent, he means go back to that type of commitment and devotion and joy that you had back then. Repent. Return to that. Although we are not dead spiritually, and I doubt if anyone here is, otherwise you would not be here to worship God. That same message can help keep us spiritually healthy. So I want you this morning to take a moment and remember how you felt when not only you heard the gospel, but you obeyed the gospel. You confessed your faith in Jesus. You repented, you were baptized, how you felt at that moment you came up out of the watery grave of baptism. Remember that excitement. I don't know about you, but I can still remember that. It was a thrilling moment. It was a, a nervous moment, I remember. I actually came up out of that water trembling, and only in part because the water in the baptistry at the Adrian Church of Christ had not yet been heated, so it was very cold water. But I was just kind of trembling, nervous, excited, very happy. Very happy. And, you know, just as important as to remember that moment is to remember why you obeyed the gospel. Why you became a Christian. And it's very important for us to keep that in mind. Because during these days we're going through in this world, in our own country today, <laughs> remembering that will help us to persevere, to keep going. Forgetting that. Forgetting how we felt and why we became Christians is a big mistake. I know none of us would do that intentionally. But we need to work on remembering it. And for this reason, I'm sharing ten reasons why we are Christians. Last Sunday, I cited the most obvious reason. So that we can go to heaven and be with God in Christ. The Bible says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. So we talked about heaven last Sunday. Heaven is a place of total joy, happiness, rest, rewards, reunions, sights that will defy imagine or description, I'm sorry, including the countless thousands of angels, the other creatures, created beings in heaven that we'll see that it would be almost impossible to describe with words. And the glory of God and Jesus Christ. A place where God shines brighter than the sun or all the suns combined. And at the same time, I talked about the fact heaven will be so great because of what will not be there. 
No worries. No worries. No tears, no death, no sorrow, no crying or pain. And I added last week, no temptation. Again, I stress, there are times when I'm tempted and I give in and I just get so aggravated. I felt just like Corey in his prayer this morning, just aggravated when I let God down again. And I just think, I just can't wait to go to a place where there's none of that. No temptation to do, think, say anything evil. I look forward to heaven so much, I know you do as well. But as wonderful as heaven's going to be, there's other reasons to be a Christian. Let's continue to explore the subject. The second reason to be a Christian, and that we are Christians, is to avoid the latter part of that scripture reading that Matt shared with us earlier. To avoid hell. I'm going to limit my comments on hell because I do plan to preach a sermon on this subject. It goes beyond what I'm talking about now. And the reason I'm going to preach, I don't like to preach on hell. But as Betty Jones' mother used to remind me, Ruby Pierce, she said, you know, every preacher should preach on hell several times a year because we need to remember the place we do not want to go. And she was right. But there's a lot of odd ideas, a lot of myths about hell, so we'll explore those in an upcoming lesson. But I assure you, and I don't need to, you know, hell is a place that no one, if they understand it, would want to go. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, we read that the devil who deceived them, that's the devil who deceives the world today and tempts us, was cast, this is future, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, what a horrendous smell that would be, where the beast and the false prophet are. They'll be thrown there too. And they will be tormented, tormented day and night forever. And only described as day and night because it just doesn't end, the suffering, the torment. And again, as Matt shared from Revelation 21, verse 8, the cowardly. Now, we're not talking about a Christian who from time to time is not as courageous as he or she should be and ask for forgiveness. No, we're talking about people who that's just their lifestyle. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the atheist, the abominable, and there are a lot of those in the world today, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, witchcraft, idolaters, and all liars. Don't forget about that. We'll talk about that tonight. (laughs) Shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Marshall Keeble, when he was alive, used to say this. He said, if you took a man out of hell and threw him right into the hottest furnace on earth, He would freeze to death. Think about that. Because hell is so much hotter than anything that we can experience or have on planet Earth. So avoiding hell is a big reason to be a Christian. The third reason, because God so loves sinners like us that he was willing to devise a plan to save us. I cannot even begin to fathom why God would go through the trouble of devising such a plan to save us. You see how, regardless of how good you thought you were before you became a Christian, we were no better than the tax collector referenced by Jesus in Luke 18, 13, who in his prayer would not look up to heaven but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And as much as Corey prayed about that this morning, it would be far short of what this man prayed, that tax collector. And folks, we were no better off. There are no, none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, verse 10. All we like sheep, according to the prophet Isaiah, are all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone into his own way. Isaiah 53, verse 6. More to the point, Isaiah 64, verse 6. We are all like an unclean thing. Do you know what that word unclean in the Hebrew typically denotes? Human excrement. 
That's what we're like. And all our righteousness, all these good things we think we do, are like filthy rags. You know what? One preacher boldly but very correctly translated that. He says, all our good works are like filthy, are like not just garbage. I mean, human excrement and, and our good works, I'm sorry, our good works are like soiled bathroom tissue. And we thought we were so good. Do you know one of the most righteous men that ever lived? Job. Admitted before God. Isaiah, or, I'm sorry, Job chapter 40 and verse, one, verse 4. He said, Behold, I am vile. I'm just no good God. There may never have lived a more righteous man than Job. But he knew Compared to God, with the sins he did commit, he was vile. And regardless of all our guilt, God was willing to devise and implement of an incredible plan that would not only save us, but would require the death of his son and the suffering of his son. I don't think it would have hurt God so much if his son could have died instantly, but he didn't. John 3, 16, again, this idea I shared earlier, for God so loved the world himself to let go of him that he sent his only begotten son. Years ago, a man that operated a railroad drawbridge over a, a river brought his eight-year-old son to work. And at one point in the day, he was lowering the bridge so approaching passenger train could safely cross. And he heard his son cry out. His son had tripped and fallen into the massive gears that operated the bridge. And this man was in the worst predicament anyone can imagine. If he allowed the bridge to lower, his son would be slowly, painfully crushed in the teeth of those gears. But if he stopped the bridge from lowering, the 90 plus passengers and crew of that train would plummet to their deaths in the river below. What to do? He found the strength to have more concern for 90 plus strangers and let them live while his son, and he heard the screaming of his son die. Not unlike how God felt. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. God, here's his plan, sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our, our sins, 1 John 4, 9 and 10. How could someone seriously know that and understand it and not want to be a Christian to know that God would do that for us? When we, like Job, are so vile. The fourth reason we're Christians is because Jesus loved us enough to cooperate with that plan, even though it meant he would suffer and die in our place. And remember, God didn't force him. God didn't throw Jesus out of heaven. Jesus left of his own accord. In fact, just before his death, or not too long before his death, in John chapter 3, verse 18, speaking of his life, he said, I lay it down of myself. I chose to do this thing. Nobody forces me. Nobody takes my life. I give it. I lay it down. The Bible says, for scarcely, which means very rarely, <laughs> for a righteous man will one die. Yet, perhaps for a good man, I mean a truly good man, someone would even dare to die. Romans 5, verse 7. But I, and many of you, <laughs> 
We're the farthest thing from a good man or a righteous man when Jesus died for us. You see, what we were didn't matter to Jesus. While we were still sinners, He died for us. Romans 5 and verse 6. Romans 5 verse 6. Christ died for the ungodly. Thank God that when Jesus came, He didn't focus on what we were, not on our sins. He focused on our souls. That's what He kept His eyes on. I want these people in heaven. And a fifth reason we're Christians is because God loves us enough not only to forgive our sins, but to forget them. I mean, forget them completely, forever. Now let me ask you, how many sins have you committed in your life? From the time you were old enough to sin, to say, to this day. Well, obviously, who could answer such a question? Although one preacher tried, he was asked that question. I think, I, I don't know if this was a skeptic, an atheist that asked him, but I think it was, he was asked, like, how many sins did you commit or have you committed in your life? And you know what he said? He said, well, he thought a moment. He says, well, if you'll let me round it, you let me round it up to the nearest 100,000, I think I could tell you. And he said, I figure about 2,700,000. And he said, although I'm probably low. You know, when you think of every possible thing you can do, say, think, and I think our thoughts cause more sin than anything else. Who could count our sins? But thank God that by His plan, God's plan, Jesus' indescribable suffering and death on the cross was just enough for God to say, I can forgive and I can erase every stain, every trace of everyone's sins who cooperate with my plan in coming to Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, He, speaking of Jesus, in the future, was wounded horribly for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, which means severe punishment, for our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes, during the scourging, by His stripes, we're healed. He was cut off from the land of the living. The word cut off means to die relatively quickly. Not of old age, not of sickness. The idea being to die in a day. He was cut off from the land of the living. Isaiah 53, verse 8. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Stricken means, again, to be punished unmercifully. But as a result, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he, God, removed our transgressions from us. Psalms 103, verse 12. As a result, our sins, everyone have been cast into the depths of the sea, Micah 7, 19. As a result, our sins, God will remember no more. Ask as you want for sin you have previously confessed. God, I still feel so bad about that. Forgive me. And God would say, forgive what? There is no memory. I'm sorry. You are mistaken, my child. (laughs) We'll pause here and continue next Sunday. More good reason to be a Christian. But last Sunday, I closed the lesson by asking this. And I'll ask again. I want you to take a moment and think about it. Other than being with God and Jesus and hopefully many loved ones and many we read about in the Bible... What attracts you most about going to heaven? What is it about heaven? And I talked about, you know, going back to the feeling I had when I was a young child of, of no worries, that mom and dad would take care of everything. And, I, and I, I, I love the thought of having that feeling again. But there's another feeling, and I, I based this on a comment I heard. Someone was asked the same question, and the person said, I look forward to the fact that heaven is a place where recess never ends. 
And when I heard that, I instantly agreed. I thought, you know, during my first five years of school, I didn't like school. But I loved recess. That was my favorite part of school. I mean, being able to run around and, and play and shout and swing and get on the seesaw, sometimes painfully, and climbing the monkey bars and going down the slides and just being a child. I love that. And the only bad thing was what that bell would always ring and then it's back to the grind. Well, you know, in heaven, that bell will never ring. And we can play and have fun and sing and shout. And sometimes, sometimes God may occasionally say, now, come here. Would you just sit in my lap a moment? Let's just sing a few songs together. I can't wait. Can't wait. Most of you, if not all, are heading to heaven. But if you're not, if there's anything between you and God, take care of it today. If you need to repent, if you need to be restored, if you need our prayers just for your strength, we'll pray for you. You just have to let us know. Most all of you are Christians, but if anyone has not obeyed the gospel, you can do that this morning. God is calling for you. He's always calling for sinners to come home. And come forward, confess your faith in Jesus. And with a heart that's penitent, we'll be happy to baptize you into Christ. If you need to, would you come? Please come. If you need anything, please come.